Yes, I have, in fact, gone home after work and cried about feeling like a bad therapist sometimes. Okay, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming back if you've been here before, or hi, welcome if you're new. My name's Mickey, I'm a therapist, and we talk about therapy things on this channel. I just spit on my face. Today, we're talking about uh, signs that your therapist sucks because I get a lot of questions about like, how do you know if your therapist is a good one? And like, how to assess for a good fit with a therapist and all of these things. People have lots of questions about the early stages of therapy, which I think makes total sense. It's sort of a mysterious and like mystical thing if you've never experienced it. So I wanna talk to you about some signs that your therapist sucks both from the outside, like before you engage with this person. Like for example, if you find them on a therapist search engine, um, or something like that. And also some signs that your therapist sucks after you've like engaged with them. Things that might be red flag behaviors once you're already, um, you know, in therapy with them. So without further ado, let's talk about our first sign that your therapist sucks, <laughs> which is that they claim to be apolitical. This is something that is a little bit of an unpopular take in the therapy community, but I don't care because <laughs> I think it's important. And also because quite honestly, the discipline is continuing to evolve over time as uh, new therapists enter the field and gain more maturity and experience and sort of rewrite the norms of our community, which I think is the way it should be. But previously the industry standard thought process regarding politics and like divisive socio-political issues is that therapists should be a blank slate, right? We should be uninvolved in those pursuits and we should also not be vocal about that with our clients because it's not our place and it can be alienating and it's, you know, self-disclosure is not important and all of these types of things, right? And listen, I want to be clear that your therapist trying to shove their political agenda down your throat sucks. That's not good either, right? Your therapist should not be using your therapy sessions to host a TED Talk about their own personal beliefs about socio-political conflicts and things like that. And also, the truth is that we as human beings don't exist in a vacuum. It is simply disingenuous to pretend that our clients aren't being affected by the greater uh, cultural context and the confines in which we exist, right? And so for therapists to claim to be these blank slate people who are unaffected and uncaring also, Jesus, there's a bug in here, sorry. Um, I almost inhaled it into my mouth. <laughs> that would have been traumatic for us all. But for therapists to pretend that they're unaffected by these things is first of all, not true, but second of all, really invalidating for their clients because it's entirely possible, I would say at this point, if not probable, exceedingly common for a good amount of people's depression and anxiety and general fucking existential dread to be related to like the state of affairs, right? It's really difficult to exist in a late stage uh, capitalist dystopian nightmare and not have any feelings about that. And so if we as therapists are being like, I don't know what you're talking about. Hello? That's weird and also not helpful. It's also really important for therapists as people who are often um, involved in social justice um, communities to be aware of the ways that like we ourselves are participating, benefiting from, and um, perpetuating injustice, inequity, discrimination, and oppression on behalf of other people. And also for us to be aware and to be educated about those topics so that, for example, one of our clients uh, is struggling with like, very valid feelings about being oppressed or marginalized in some uh, form or fashion that we can in intellectually and, and intelligently engage with this person, right? To not be educated about social justice issues and to not have skin in the game when it comes to the topic of like social progressiveness and like the the moving of moving forward of like political issues and things like that is just at this point, like in my opinion, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. And this attitude that you should just never have an opinion about these things is like antiquated. It's old. It's also, for what it's worth, very much a byproduct of the way that the therapy industry is steeped in male-centric white supremacist values, right? It's important for us to acknowledge as clinicians that the field was founded by white supremacist misogynistic men who very much uplifted values and beliefs and political norms that benefited them and oppressed other people. In order for the discipline to continue moving forward and to actually serve the people that we claim to care about, it's important for us to unlearn this value in my opinion. Okay, before we talk about my second sign, I wanna to talk to you about this week's sponsor, which is Paired. For those of you who don't know, Paired is a relationship care app that has daily couples questions and relationship games and quizzes and exercises that you can do with your partner. Erin and I are no strangers to needing to work on our relationship. And one of the ways that we do that is with Paired. We've really enjoyed incorporating the app into our time with one another because we can choose an exercise or a game and set some time aside for just the two of us to really connect and like get to know each other better even after all this time 
um, and also to just like share that moment of connection with one another. In the app, you can start a conversation by selecting a type like a quiz or a game or an issue like intimacy or communication, or you can choose by expert and then you and your partner can answer the questions. And once you both finish, you unlock each other's answers, which is my favorite because then you can compare. Erin and I love turning it into sort of a friendly little competition of like who got the most right answers and who answered what, because sometimes the answers are really surprising actually. Erin and I are really loving using Paired and I think that you will too. So go click the link in the description. You can get a seven day free trial and 25% off of Paired Premium so that you can get started on deepening and maintaining your connection with your partner. Thank you so much to Paired for sponsoring this week's video. Let's go ahead and hop back in. Okay, my second sign that your therapist sucks is that they are an expert in everything. This will show up for people oftentimes on therapist search engines where you'll see like on Therapy Den or whatever, people have the opportunity to list their expertise, right? If you notice that a person has listed every single fucking condition in the DSM as one of their specialties, bad sign, get out of there. <laughs> because the truth is that no good therapist can be an expert in all things and also Oftentimes, this is a mistake that people will make because they are trying to fill their practice, right? I very much, I wanna be super clear, owning a private practice is really fucking hard, right? It's really difficult. Um, and getting enough clients on your books to make ends meet and to pay your bills can be a really difficult thing. So it makes sense that people are trying to cast a wide net to try to get clients on their books. However, the thing about this to remember is that first of all, therapists should be prioritizing work that is both fulfilling to them and like uplifting lifting to them, um, but also is accurate and true about their actual expertise, right? This is why, for example, when I talk to you guys about stuff on the channel, I tend to sort of stick to a couple of core <laughs> subjects, and that's because I'm not fucking educated enough to talk about things like personality disorders, for example. You will notice that I've never made a dedicated video about personality disorders, nor have I ever taken on a client whose primary concern is a personality disorder, because I'm not educated to do that. I'm, I simply lack the credentials to do that. And it's not ethical for me to engage with or to communicate to a client like, oh yeah, I can take that issue on. No, I can't. No, I fucking cannot. And so therapists who list themselves as an expert in everything, one of those things is going to be a fucking lie. And the problem is that when you choose that therapist, you're usually taking a gamble about whether or not they actually are an expert in the thing that they claim to be that you're looking for, right? So you're much better served looking for a therapist who is more honest and who has a, a more pared down list of expertise and specialties and things like that, because the odds that they are actually credentialed to be working on those issues is much, much higher. Alternatively, my third sign, third fine, third sign that your therapist sucks um, is that they're a one trick pony. If your therapist only has like, for example, CBT, I know I caught a lot of heat actually for not liking CBT. I'm mad about it. If your therapist only has one modality that they are trained in and qualified to perform, that might be a red flag. That might be a problem because the truth is that therapists can specialize in one modality, right? It's very, very common for therapists to niche themselves down into like CBT or EMDR or somatic experiencing or um, internal family systems, right? All of those are, are valid techniques and, and modalities and ways to approach therapy. And it is entirely possible, if not probable, that you will end up with a client on your caseload who won't resonate with that, right? So the thing here is that, first of all, it's common for a therapist who recognize that they're out of their depth to refer people out, right? That's very valid. And I'm not saying that people should stop doing that. And also, it's good to have education, experience, expertise, training in more than at least one thing so that should the need arise, especially if you have an established relationship with a client that like this modality is just not working anymore or we've plateaued, that we're able to incorporate or pull little bits of stuff from all over the place in order to better suit our client's needs, right? This was also another common critique that people had of the CBT video that I made. I'll put the link for that below, by the way, or like up here, I think is where it goes if you wanna watch that. But a lot of the, the pushback that I got on that video was that people don't don't uh, often just exist in the CBT world. They'll pull things from lots of different places. This is a good thing, right? This is also why I said what I said about CBT, which is that if you're a one trick pony and you only know how to do CBT for every single issue, we might run into problems, right? If you treat every hammer or every problem, what is the thing with the hammer? Everything is a, a nail, right? Like you get it. I don't know what the fucking phrase is. I don't do tools. I play with people's brains. But <laughs> if we <laughs> treat every issue like it can be solved with the same tool, we're gonna run into problems. And so that's also uh, potentially a sign that your relationship with your therapist or that this, this therapist you found on a, a search engine might not be a good fit for you. Okay, the fourth sign that I have for you that your therapist sucks is that they're a yes man. 
This is potentially an unpopular opinion, but it's true. If your therapist never challenges you in therapy or never tells you like, you know what? That one was you. That one was your fault. We might have a problem there because the truth is that in the same way that our, uh, you know, private personal, like interpersonal relationships require us to be honest with folks that like love you the most, but that one was on you. It's not really all that different in therapy. I tell my clients all the time, it is not my job to blow smoke up your ass. And also along with that, when I tell you no, no, like you're validated in this or like you were very much right about this one. You can trust that I mean it because I'm not just gonna sit here and yes man you all day <laughs> to say like, you're never wrong, you're so perfect. That's not true and that's also not helpful, right? The role of a good therapist is to be honest with you and to be clear with you in a kind way, in a compassionate way, in a respectful way that sometimes it's us, right? <laughs> sometimes we're the ones who need to do work around a particular issue if this bug flies in my mouth, I'm quitting YouTube forever. And that honesty, that like respect is a really integral part of the therapeutic alliance. And also for a lot of folks, it might be the very first time that they see compassionate and respectful pushback or like honesty modeled in a relationship. It's very common for folks who are in therapy to have been traumatized to some degree uh, somewhere along the way, right? And so we might not have experience with somebody again, kindly and compassionately saying, I can't co-sign that behavior, I'm sorry, right? Like, I believe in you, I respect you, I very much have faith in your ability to move past this issue and also I cannot co-sign this behavior because it's not good for you, because it was hurtful to someone else, because this is not a thing that's okay for us to continue uh, modeling in ourselves or in our relationships. And so that honesty, again, it might be the first time that somebody experiences that kindly and can also go a long way in our ability to uh, work through things like rejection sensitivity dysphoria, for example, boundary setting for another example. Um, but it's also, again, it's an integral part of people learning how to grow, right? You can't be in therapy and have a therapist just tell you, there's nothing wrong because you're not growing then. That's not actually helping you do anything. You're just being dishonest. Okay, the fifth thing that I wanna talk to you about is that your uh, therapist, they might suck if they have an answer for everything. The truth is that therapists are people, right? I will be the first person to tell you that it's very important for a therapist to be well-educated, for a therapist to continue learning, for a therapist to be wisely using their continued education units and their licensure and all of that to form a picture of a person who's well-educated and who's wise and who's like invested in continuing to grow their skill set. And also, people are people. Sometimes we don't have the fucking answers to things. And it's very okay for your therapist to say, I don't know, right? Like, maybe I don't have an answer to this specific question, so I'll find it for you. So I'll look that up, so I'll make an effort to do some searching in between now and the next time we meet, and I will have an answer for you next time. Or for your therapist to say, Maybe there's not a right answer here, right? Relationships and the human experience is kind of a messy thing sometimes. And the truth is that, especially in these moments where we have like a moral or ethical dilemma, there might not be a perfect, definitive, correct or wrong answer. And it's important for your therapist to be able to be honest with you, to say like, I don't know. It might not also be our place to say, I think this is right. Like, you're right, like your therapist <laughs> might have their own personal inkling of like, this is what I would do in my own experience. That's not always appropriate or applicable for us to say though. And so sometimes being a good and safe therapist requires us to say, I don't know what you should do, right? This is a moment where it's really important for you to reflect on your values, on your beliefs, on your safety, on your wants and needs in a relationship or in a situation and make a decision guided by those things. We can talk through what that looks like, what's coming up for you, how do you feel about that? What experience do you have with making a decision like this? The last time that you made a decision like this, what did that look like? How did that go? How did the consequence of that impact you? Those are all things that your therapist can do, but it's important for a therapist to not be the person who is like always having an answer for everything and saying, oh no, this is the right choice. Oh, this is the way that you should do that. Because this is also veering into giving advice, right? Contrary to popular belief, good therapists aren't out here being like, do that, do this. This is the right answer. Choose letter C. That's not appropriate, right? 
The the truth is that therapists are are there to help deepen your understanding of what's happening for you, not to speak definitively from on high about what the correct or right or wrong answer is. Okay, my last sign that your therapist and mine suck is that they can't take criticism. All of the things that I have listed in this video before this point are things that are workable. In my opinion, if your therapist is able to take criticism and able to receive feedback, I know that I look like I'm really going through it. It's There's a bug in here, I pro it's fine. If your therapist is able to take criticism, then your therapist will be able to recover from things like, hey, why do you always have an answer for stuff? <laughs> like, can you stop doing that? Or can you stop giving me advice? Or like, hey, it seems like you're only really good at applying CBT stuff to my problems and that's not working for me. Can we do something else? If your therapist is able to take criticism, then they'll be able to go, okay, yeah, you're probably right. Let's work on that, right? I will put an invested amount of effort into preparing some, you know, different exercises or modalities. I can also look at a referral for you if you are, you know, wanting to see somebody who has a different skill set than me. But if your therapist is able to receive criticism, first of all, they're going to be a safe person for you to voice how you feel, which is necessary. That's critical. But also they're going to be a person who is continuing to grow and evolve and change, which in my opinion is the mark of a good therapist. If your therapist is incapable of receiving criticism, especially about something small, this is a huge red flag. Therapists should also be practicing the skill of removing our ego from the equation when we talk about our work with clients, right? Obviously, as a person, it feels really bad when clients point out to you that like, hey, you suck at this, right? Or like, you shit the bed at this particular intervention. Like, that doesn't feel good. I'm not going to lie to you and be like, I'm so unaffected. Like, yes, I have, in fact, gone home after work and cried about feeling like a bad therapist sometimes. And I use that experience to improve myself and to say, I don't want to fucking feel like that anymore. And so for those reasons, I'm going to work on it, right? Being a therapist who can take criticism is really, really important. The other consideration here that I want to draw your attention to is that sometimes, again, in the same realm where clients might not have had a respectful pushback modeled in their relationships previously, sometimes therapists are the first people that someone might feel safe with to say, hey, like I have a criticism for you about X, Y, or Z. And it's very, very important that in that moment, a therapist is able to suspend our own hurt feelings or ego and be a safe person for you to do that. This has also happened uh, for what it's worth, just at least in my clinical experience. I know for a fact that other therapists have experienced this also. That sometimes clients have uh, criticism or hurt feelings or like anger or frustration that might not even be about you <laughs> necessarily, but it gets brought at you, right? For example, people who have never felt heard or respected in sharing their opinions in relationships prior to this point might voice their opinion or their feelings in a really explosive and angry way, right? It has very much happened to me that I've been on the receiving end of someone blowing up at me, saying like, you know, oh, you're being this way or you're hurting my feelings, or you're doing X, Y, or Z. And the important thing in that moment as a good therapist, if you're able to take criticism, is to pause and move yourself backwards and ask yourself like, is this really about me? Because like, first of all, I need to be able to take that criticism. But second of all, sometimes people, again, when they don't have familiarity with what it looks like to voice their opinion, will come at you sideways when it might not be warranted. And being a safe person requires you to clock that and to remove your ego from that equation. So for a whole bunch of reasons, <laughs> therapists really, really need to be able to take criticism. And if your therapist can't do that, to me, this is like a fatal flaw in a therapeutic relationship. I have very much ended uh, therapeutic involvement with clinicians because they were not capable of receiving my critique or pushback or feedback, and that's enough. So if you notice that happening for you, for you in your therapeutic relationship, please know that you are very valid in saying, I need to call it for this reason because it's a really difficult thing to work around. And it's also not your job, right? As the client, it's not your job to have to work around um, a, a really serious flaw like that. And so it's very much okay and valid to say, I just don't wanna pursue services with you anymore. Okay, this is far from an exhaustive list. We have made videos like this on the channel before. I'll put this uh, up here if I can find it. It's been a minute since we've talked about this, but if you guys have uh, more questions about therapist red flags, therapist green flags even, um, or if you wanna share your own in the comments, I know that everybody has their own red flags and green flags about therapists. So uh, please share with the class. Let us know what you have observed in your own experience and like the video. If you like the video, we do make content like this, uh, but we also do a fun podcast 
pop culture moment every now and again. If you don't know, by the way, I have a podcast that goes up on Thursdays and we do live streams on Friday where we watch reality TV, uh, which is a fun time, so you should come hang out. That said, if you like the video, like the video, you can subscribe um, and then share the video to help the channel grow and help each other grow and I will see you guys next Saturday.